Hello, this is Jim McKeith, lead worldwide developer evangelist and engineer for Barcadero Technologies, and welcome to this Fire Deck Skill Sprint on in memory data sets or the FD MIM table. The great thing about Fire Deck is it works everywhere, it works on all the platforms with all the languages that you would be developing with. So whether you're using Rad Studio, App Method, C, Object Pascal, Android, or Windows, you can take advantage of this skill sprint. So the FD MIM table is the disconnected or in-memory data set that comes with FireDAC. It's similar to the T-Client data set that's been around for a while, but it's a, a newer technology that comes as part of FireDAC. It has one advantage over T-Client data set right off the bat in that it is available in the Pro edition of Rad Studio at Delphi C++ Builder, as well as the Enterprise edition, where T-Client data sets only in the Enterprise edition. So it provides... Um, the ability to have a data set in memory that is not connected to a database. So now you can use it with a database. You can use a different data set, for example, the TFD query, and pull data from a database and then copy that data into the FD mem table. So it can be used with a database, but the FD mem table itself does not have any concept of being connected to a database. You can, it's in memory, but you can also persist it to disk, both at design time and runtime using load and save to file options. It has streaming options, so you can stream it between multiple tiers in a multi-tier architecture. And in that regard, it's used in data snap. It's also used with our REST client components. So when we're pulling data from a REST service and we want to store that uh, column loader data, the data that's in columns and rows, in memory, we store it in a uh, FD mem table. So anytime you're going to be dealing with data that is in a uh, column and row configuration, so kind of like a spreadsheet, except that each column has a specific data type and certain attributes, whether it be width, being, being acquired, required, etc., that is a good use for the TFD mem table. So it could be, it could behave like a poor man's or a simple database. Now that being said. If you were to go with an actual database like IB Light, that's an embedded database that so doesn't have external dependencies, licenses included with your development tools, so and adds a lot more features. So if you really do need a database, I would suggest going with IB Light. But if you don't need a full database, if you just want some simple functionality of storing some data in columns and rows, that's when FD MIM table is good for you. Um, you can combine it with Local SQL, which we'll talk about next week to do simple query operations. So you can use local SQL to query your FD mem table in memory. That makes it very powerful. Also, we talked about last week, the ETL components, and you can combine that with the um, FD mem table to, for example, you can use the batch move to read data in from a CSV file, a text file, into the FD mem table. So it allows you to work with other data sources besides databases. So very flexible. It's probably the most flexible FireDAC component because all the other FireDAC components are tied to either a specific task or tied to a database. FD MIM table is not. It can be used across the board in lots of situations. You probably find that if you really understand what you can do with an FD MIM table, that you'll find that you want to use it in a lot of different applications. Um, just because of its flexibility in ways that you can deal with data and then persist that data back out. So it's, when it comes to persisting data, there's three different formats. Uh, these are defined by the TFD storage format enumeration. The first value is auto. And auto is based on the file extension. So if you're saving it to a file or reading it from a file, it will look at the extension of the file. So if it's .xml, it'll be an XML file. If the uh, extension is not recognized or not specified, or if you're doing it via a stream, because the stream doesn't have a file name, then it does it in binary. So binary is the most efficient of these formats. So if you look at that picture over there with the streams of water coming down off this waterfall, the one on the left, the thin stream, is binary. It's the most efficient. It uses the least amount of data to represent what's in memory. Okay, so if you were to save the same data set to disk three times, the binary file would be the smallest. Um, one thing about 
each of these different formats is you need to load the correct unit in to uh, save it in that format. So that means even if you're using auto, you still need to provide the correct uses unit and users clause. This can be done via a component. There's a component you can drop down that provides that or just by adding that uses to users clause. And that's because each of those different units actually has the code that supports that format. So that means if you're only going to support binary, if that's all you care about, you don't need to load the additional code in for XML and JSON. This results in a smaller, more efficient uh, executable from your program. The first four bytes, the signature of that binary file is ADBS. So if you have a binary file and you're not sure what it is, if you could look at it in a hex editor and you see the first four characters are ADBS, it's probably a uh, FD MIM table binary file format. The next format is XML. It's that stream over on the right. It's the biggest. It's the most verbose. So if, again, if you saved all three, saved it same data set to disk three different times, the XML file would be the biggest. That's just the nature of XML. It's got these angle brackets and it specifies names and values and all this stuff. Um, so the XML file would look like, that's to be the first line there you see is the FDBS version equals 14. That version may change in the future, but for right now that's what it says. And so that's the way you can recognize it as an XML file. Then the uh, last option is the JSON. JSON was added about a year ago, I believe, and it uses the JavaScript object notation, the curly brace notation, instead of the angle bracket notation you see in XML. And it is kind of in between. It's still plain text, so it's still human readable, machine readable, but it's not as verbose as XML. So it's that stream in the middle. It's not quite as big as XML. And that's what the start of your JSON file would look like. So here's some code examples of some common uh, functionality you might want to do with the FD MIM table. I'll show you an object Pascal first, and then I'll show you the C++ equivalent, which you'll see mainly is just differences in syntax. Since your FD MIM table is not connected to a database, you actually have to define what the columns and fields are in the columns or fields, each field is a column, in that FD MIM table. So just here you can do it in code. You just create, add a field def. So in this case, we're adding an ID field of type integer. Since the integer has a fixed size, we don't need to specify a size, so we say zero. And then the last parameter there is whether it's required or not. Um, then the second one here, we're creating name, which is a type string. And here we're specifying that it has a width of 20 characters because a string can be variable width. And again, it's not required. Then we tell it to create data set. And at that point, we have a data set that we're ready to work with. So here we're going to open it, and we're going to append a record. So in append record, you just specify all of the values in order that you want to store into that data set. If instead we want to copy data from another data set, that line there shows you how to copy data from a data set, data set one. Now, data set one can be any other T data set descendant. Okay, it doesn't have to be an FD mem table. It doesn't have to be even be a FireDAC data set. It can be a data set from any other data source. And in this case, we're also specifying that we want to copy the structure of that data set as well. So this would be a way that you could persist data from another data set, maybe keep it in memory. And then you could maybe save that data set off to disk or whatever as a way to do an offline briefcase model, for example. Here's the C++ equivalent. I will point out, for the most part, it's just difference in syntax, although in the append data, I'm showing a different option of way to do this by using field by name. So we're called append, inserts a blank record, and then we say uh, field by name, ID, field by name, name. And this just specifies the individual fields that we want to access. And so if you had a lot of fields and you only want to access a few of them, this would be the way to go. So I'm going to do a demonstration now. This is all going to be in Object Pascal, but as you saw, the main differences really are just syntax. So hopefully, as a C++ developer, you'll be able to uh, extrapolate what you need to do in order to implement this in C++. So let's take a look at some of the things you can do at design time with the FD MIM table. So I'm going to go ahead and add an FD MIM table to my form. Uh, everything I'm going to show you, you can do via code as well. I'll show you through at design time. So as I mentioned, there's these links here. This is the binary XML and JSON that you'll need to include if you're wanting to open or save from a stream. Now, if I'm just going to open this from a um, file at design time, I don't need to include the link, but most likely you're going to be opening and saving the files. So let's go ahead and include the binary storage link. And so what this will do is it'll automatically add the uh, necessary unit to your application. So I'll go ahead and hit save. 
and we'll see the standard storage bin has been added. That's the only thing this component does, it adds that unit to users clause. So actually you can either add that manually or you can delete this afterwards and that unit will remain in your users clause. So that's how you do it. And again, that's just so that you can have the, uh, your execute only has the code in there for what you need. So let's first, let's look at how we would open a, uh, fi a data set at design time. So these are the samples that we ship with um, the product. And XML, these are uh, client data set XML files. So I'm gonna go over to binary files and let's go ahead and load animals up. And we'll bind this visually just so we can see the data in here. To new control, grid, and there we go. There is our data loaded up at design time. Now, this data all exists inside this FDMIM table. It's storing that data, and that data is uh, deployed, it bundled inside the executable. It's all compiled in. If we run this and make a change to this data and then close it and restart it, it will revert back to what it was before. Not because it's re-retrieving the data from the database, but because the data remains unchanged in the binary. Now, if we wanted to persist changes between sessions, then on application shutdown, we would then do a save to file and specify a file format, probably binary. And then on startup, we would check to see if that file exists. And if it does, we'd load it from file and that would persist the changes between sessions. So that would give you a simple data storage for this column and row data. Let's say you want to specify your own uh, columns and rows. So go ahead and clear the data out. Now you notice I've cleared the data, but the columns are still here. And that's because those are defined in the field defs. So let's go ahead and turn off the data set, make it inactive. And come here to field defs. And we see here's all those fields. So I need to delete these. Now one note, I can actually create a new field here via this field def dialog, or I can create it via the usual add fields call, uh, dialog here. So I'll just come here and say a new field and we'll call it test and we'll give it a type of string in size 20. Okay, so there's some reasons, sometimes you might want to do it the other way or here, either way works. Um, so we'll go ahead and create that one column and we'll come down here and make this guy active again. And we'll see there is our test column we've added. That's just one column, not near as useful. You could do that in a string list or a regular list for that matter, the or generic list, but that shows you how you would create your fields at runtime or at design time. And once I've created that field, I could actually save this data set out to disk. Now, this is not a um, very complex. There's no data in here. There's just one column, but I can still save it out and then reload it later. So let's take a look at how we would do this with a uh, disconnected data. So we can go here to our data explorer and I'm going to add, go to the uh, employee database, interface database, and let's go ahead and pull down the customer table. Okay, so let's bind this visually, just so we can see what's in here. Bind visually. And we'll activate that guy. So there we go, we got some uh, customer data. This is being pulled from Interbase. So now, and FireDAC, using FireDAC to pull it from Interbase. What I'm showing you here doesn't have to be done with FireDAC or Interbase. It can be done with any database, any database access components that descend from T-Dataset. Let's go down and put down a FD mem table. Let's bind this visually as well. It's new control, grid. So right now there's no data in here. If I activate it, it would give me an error and say, there's no data in there, you can't activate this. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the assigned data set and we can assign that from the customer data table. So there we go, we've copied this data set into this data set here. I showed you the code in the slides that showed you how to do that in code, but that's how you can do it in uh, design time. So at this point I could actually remove these guys here and we still have that data. And this data exists completely in the FDMEM table. And I could then save it to a file, load it from file, save it to file and reload it from file again later. So that's an example of using a disconnected data set at design time. And again, like I said, all this can be done in code as well. 
So this is going to use a little bit of code here. I've just put down a, a memo on the form and a couple of buttons. I've also added the uh, JSON storage link. So this will uh, include the unit we need in order to save to and read from JSON streams. So this first button, we're going to use a string stream and we're going to save the FDMM table to that string stream in JSON format. Then we're going to empty data set, which will completely remove everything from the data set and then put that string stream in the memo. And then this other button does the reverse. It uh, loads it back from that stream again. So I run this. If you notice our customer right here is signature design. So when I run this over here, if we scroll down here, so the first thing we see is a bunch of columns uh, defining the, or class column. This is defining the columns that are in the data set. But if we scroll down here to the right spot, postal code, there we go. Customer 101, so let's change that to um, 1011. And instead of signature design, we'll call it JSON design. Okay, so now we'll push it back in here. So we see the values came back. So uh, instead of saving to stream, we could also use the same format to save to file. So we just say save to file, specify the format. Now remember in streams, the default is binary, but binary is kind of hard to read and edit in a uh, memo field, so I use JSON. Uh, then <clears throat> specify the format, save it to a stream. Uh, with a file, you would specify a file name and then load it back up. Same format to go both directions there. In summary, the FD mem table is your data set, your T data set descendant for in memory or disconnected use. It supports copying data from another data set, file and stream persistence, cached updates, which gives you the option to uh, make updates while the data set's offline and later pump those updates, the changes up to a data set. So actually posting them to a database at that point. It also has cloned cursors where you can have multiple current records at the same time and nested data sets. So nested data sets allow you to make a column that is another data set. This allows for very complex uh, hierarchical data that you can't really specif specify in normal um, data set formats. So very powerful there to be able to do nested data sets. Here are some resources for you. This is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to FD mem table. It is very, very flexible. It has a lot of amazing features in it. Um, so here's the links to doc wiki as well as the samples, the samples that are provided. They're only object Pascal samples right now. The first one there is a few mem table examples. The second one actually is a local SQL example, which I said, we'll talk about local SQL next week, but there's an example there using local SQL against an FD mem table. The, probably the most useful though here is down here at the bottom where it says blog posts. The first one is Kerry Jensen's Code Rage 9 video comparing the FD mem table to the client data set. So if you want a deeper understanding about uh, in memory data sets and then how the FD mem table is different from the client data set, check that out. If you don't know who Kerry Jensen is, he wrote the book literally on client data set. He has a number of books available on that. And uh, he's a big fan of FireDAC as well. And so he's given some really good coverage to the FD mem table versus client data set here. And they're not exactly the same. There, there's some differences and there's times you may choose one over the other. Generally, we recommend using the FD mem table, but watch that video there and then you'll know when you'd want to choose one over the other. There also is a uh, chat log or a Q&A log from that video. So that video has the Q&A at the end after Carrie's presentation. But if you just want to read the log of the Q&A, it's available for you there, which can be a, uh, useful for a quick reference. Also, another FireDAC video there is the FireDAC Tips, Tricks, and News. This is from Dimitri. Dimitri is the guy that wrote FireDAC or wrote the majority of FireDAC. And uh, it's not specific to FD Min table, but it's got some great treatment and great coverage of FireDAC. So recommend you check that out there in order to get some better understanding about FireDAC in general, as well as some things about FD mem table. Now the last link here is the delphi.org slash question mark P equals 1933. This link is to my blog post that has all of these links and more. It'll have the replay of this video and everything else you need, download the slides, etc. So, uh, if you only remember one link, if you only write one link down, get that one there. Not that it's the best, but just because it summarizes everything else and points you to these videos and resources. I'll put this link back up again, this page back up at the end, just in case you didn't get it everything. So next time 
we have a special preview of the EMS push notification. So this is a sneak peek from a future release. This is the normal skill sprints, not the FireDAC skill sprints, but it's gonna show you how to use push notifications from EMS server. So this means you can do push notifications without using a backend as a service provider. Very cool. I uh, will point out that there's a change in time. So we're now allowed on daylight savings time here in the US. So the US times are the same, 6, 11, and 5 on Tuesday, March 10th. But in London and Milan and Sydney, that time has changed because of the differential between daylight savings time here and other countries. I wish they'd just get rid of daylight savings time, but hey, that's the way it is. I've also provided the UTC time for you there, uh, 13 UTC, 18 UTC, and zero UTC. So you can uh, schedule appropriately for whatever city you happen to be in. If you're not signed up for the regular skill sprint series, there's that link there. It's the first link on the left to sign up for the regular skill sprint series. The Next, in the next FireDAC Skill Sprint series is Local SQL. So in this one, I'll come back and talk to you about how to use Local SQL to run SQL statements locally in memory against data sets. It doesn't have to be FDMEM table, it doesn't have to be FireDAC data sets. You can run SQL against these data sets without going talking to a server. Very cool, very powerful. Again, make note of the change in times, and that's on Thursday, the 19th of March. Unless you're in Tokyo or Sydney, then it's Friday the 20th. And you should already be signed up for this, but if somehow you're not, it's the second sign up link on that link there. So let's talk about some special offers. I'm always surprised how many people come to me after the special offers expire and say, hey, I didn't upgrade, I'd like to upgrade now. So that's why I always make it a point to specify these because if you miss them, I'm sorry, it's probably not much we can do about it. First one is BOGO, buy one, get one. Buy Rad Studio, Delphi, or C++ Builder XC7 and get another tool of equal or lesser value for free. The second one is upgrade to enterprise. So if you go from pro to enterprise and you'll get a 10 user version of EMS for free. EMS is our new enterprise mobility server. That's a great way to build a REST middleware. Very easy, very powerful great features so you get that 10 licenses for free the great thing about this is ems is normally priced per user and does not have a 10 user tier so if you upgrade now you can get that 10 user tier for free which may be exactly the size you need for a small deployment we also have our bonus pack going on this is a 700 dollars value it includes the new object pascal handbook by marco Cantu, castelia for delphi this is a great productivity add-in for Delphi Object Pascal development. VCL and FireMonkey Premium Styles is a great way to make your VCL and FireMonkey apps uh, match across platforms, as well as kind of have that visual pop that you need to really stand out. It also includes the Mida Converter Basic, which does some of the heavy lifting if you're trying to convert an existing VCL application into a FireMonkey application, and additionally being able to move that across platforms. We also have a great deal going on right now that if you buy XC7, you get the next major release for free. So you'll get the update subscription for free until the next major release. And this keeps you up to date with hot fixes, exclusive content and support, as well as getting the next major release for free. Great option. Take advantage of that right now. Also, if you upgrade to XC7, you can do so from any previous version and that gives you upgrade pricing. So even if you're on a very old version, upgrade now, get that upgrade pricing and all the other bonuses you see here. For more information on these bonuses, check out uh, embarkadero.com slash radoffer, and you'll see that these bonuses all expire March 31st, 2015. After that date, they're all gone, okay? So go out there now, embarkadero.com slash radoffer, take advantage of these upgrade offers so you can take advantage of some of these great features you've seen in the Skill Sprint series. So with now, we're going to go back to do some Q&A. So if you're joining us live, we'll do some live Q&A. If you're watching the replay, you can listen to the Q&A now. I'll put the slide back up with the resources for you as well. There are a few questions came in. There were, the first question was, how many records can be loaded uh, from, for example, a CSV, an XML, or, or whatever into an FDMEM table? It really depends on the size of those records and your amount of memory. The uh, a record can be anything from a single byte to containing a whole other data set in it. So, um, 
obviously the, the bigger the record, the more or the less you could load in. I, I don't know if there's any hard, fast numbers, but uh, we'd say your mileage may vary depending on the size of your record you're pulling in. I mean, it's probably in the millions, though. Yeah, other than other than memory, right? I mean, I think the, yeah. the quote was somebody on Facebook said they tried to load 30 million records uh, into a FDMEM table. Like, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, that's, at that point, you probably want to go switch to a, uh, a at least uh, IB Lite, but it really depends on the size of your record because if it's 30 million records that are just a single byte, then that's probably easier to deal with. But if it's 30 million records that are, you know, have 100 columns and some of those columns are strings and others are maybe entire data sets in that record, then, yeah, you're going to run really quick. Yeah. Um, well, I guess you could build a 64-bit app and get some more memory app. But, again, still there's going to be some limit along the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. But see uh, there was another question about how easy you know if you've connected data set to FDM table uh, how easy is it to update the change data back to the underlying the the remote database or wherever the database is so that's that's something uh, a typical use case of FDM table just not one I covered uh, I believe that link there from Co from Kerry Jensen will go into detail about how to do that and uh, it will show you show you how to do that, but yeah, that's a it's fairly easy to do. Yep, and, the, and there's uh, I know there's there's settings or options for for auto update for caching and so on, um, but you can just say apply updates, and I think it's apply updates. Almost sure. I'll look in the doc wiki. Actually, I had the doc wiki, well, yeah. but I don't remember what yeah. to do with it. I'll find it again. A little sluggish this morning. Still dark here in Scotts Valley. Um, let's see. Uh, Raina was having some issues with links. And what I put in, Jim, is I put in the link to your uh, blog post on Delphi.org. Uh, and in there, yeah. there are links. Uh, Jim has a style on his blog that is, that is very f faint. But if you just hover over the links, like the DocWiki links, let me see if he was going from your – yeah, that takes you to the right spot. Uh, so if you just hover over, like in the DocWiki section, FD mem table, custom mem table, uh, and so on, and Q&A about mem table, um, you can click on those and uh, and get to those. And also the Q&A log, Kerry Jensen's video, and so on, those are uh, – those are linked in that blog post as well. Okay, where was I going? TFD table. Yeah, I just looked in the doc wiki. There's an apply updates. Yeah. Um, it applies updates for all records in the data set change log to the database. Yep. Use apply updates to apply changes for all records in the database data set change journal to the database. This method is useful when cached updates is true. Oh, I see. And and Reina's issue with links was, yeah. There's a thing because it's Google search, and XE6 I guess is around, been around a little longer than XE7. So if you just type um, Fire DAC uh, TFDMM table something like that, if you come up with XE6, you might get a 404, but just change the six to a seven, and that's what he did. Uh, she did. I'm sorry. That's what you do. I do it all the time. Uh, I, what I need to do is work with our web team to get uh, all the search engine optimization stuff to to make sure it hits the that the XE seven links show up. Now, there's too many links. I mean, there's five hundred thousand links. I think it's a little hard to uh, to do redirects and so on. I guess you could search the pattern for six, but. So there were some cases where in XE6 FireDoc there wasn't certain capabilities or, or links available. Anyway, um, let's see. That's the update question. Uh, special offer is for full licenses and upgrade licenses, not academic licenses. Academic licenses are already um, 
much lower price uh, for staff and or students. Okay. Yep. Um, and Jim, I think that's all the questions. Again, everyone, you've got the links on the screen. Uh, that last one, um, P equals 1933, it redirects to this uh, link that I put in the Q&A log. So, or ends up there. Yeah. But the, uh, the FD material is really flexible, really useful component. Hopefully everybody saw that. It's, it's something you can use even beyond in database connectivity. But next week we'll talk about using it with uh, local SQL as well as some other possibilities. But uh, so you can use it with a database to have a disconnected in memory data set, or you can use it anytime you just want to have uh, some columns and rows of data. Very, very flexible, very useful. And you, recommended. and you also mentioned, but you didn't demo, we have that in other demos about the REST client library. There's a, uh, what is that? There's a component for connecting a data set, uh, connecting a REST response. I guess it's the REST response data set adapter component that's part of the REST client yeah. library. And if you put that down and you point it at a data set like the TFD mem table, then, uh, then your JSON response that comes back from REST will be sent to uh, a data set so you can then, rather than having to treat it as JSON data, you can treat it as a, as a table with columns, with, field, you know, with fields and data. So uh, Jim mentioned that in, in the presentation uh, on one of the initial slides, but wasn't part of the demonstration. But you look at any of our REST client library uh, skill sprint videos and or code rage uh, sessions, and you'll, or you can go to the doc wiki and look for the REST data set adapter. REST, yeah, REST response data set adapter, and yep. uh, and you'll get it. Let's see. Yarn is saying, I would love to see a FireDuck demo program showing how to create an application doing live text search. Uh, with a full text search or database, yeah. yeah. Well, that's like I guess I've firing off that before. SQL light, you know, SQL like uh, a SQL like query. There's actually a component. There's two components out there in the Delphi space that I'm aware of. There are actually more libraries that are specifically for indexing large collections of documents of various kinds of documents and uh, searching against them. Um, I will look for the, uh, let's see. Yeah. One's called DT Search. If you go to DC, DTSearch.com, uh, David Thomas Search, I'll give you a link to that. Um, but that's text search in, a, in memory, right? Not in a SQL database? Maybe like blob field, text blobs, or whatever. Yeah, so that's gonna, what that does is that you point that to uh, a bunch of documents and it goes out and indexes those documents. Which, so the way you need to do this is you have to pull all of the keywords out of the documents that you want to be able to search. And so that goes through and indexes those documents, keep, pulls the keywords out. And then you can search against that keyword database. And so that keyword database can then be persisted in a database. And so you search against those keywords and then it says, oh, for this keyword, you want to go to this document here and it points you back to that document. And there's another database engine that is Delphi specific because DT search works across a few languages and tools, including Delphi. And the other one, and I can't remember the name of it, Rubicon. Oh, yeah, Rubicon is like href tools, right? Href tools? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, and there may be a third one, but um, I actually went through and did an evaluation of these a while ago, and they're both really good tools um, and do a great job and produce fast, fast, fast results. So Rubicon actually has a a web uh, portal where you can search through all of uh, their Delphi super page search engine is powered by uh, Rubicon so you can see how fast it searches. Okay, uh, George is saying how do you use TFD mem table in in a data snap application? 
Uh, there are examples of that, but did they, the the connected the the uh, what is it, the data adapter points to it and pulls the from data snap pulls the data and just stores it into the FD mem table and you work with it from there. Yeah, just use a TFD mem table like you would use tclient data set. I mean, exactly, just replace it. Yeah, and it works great. Yep. Um, and then. Uh, Alpha saying, if I change a DB Express based data snap server into FireDAC, do I need to also change the client into using FireDAC? Um, well, the FireDAC is only for the database for the database parts. There is an FD uh, data snap connection component, but you can leave your you can leave your data snap the same, but then you'd have both the DB Express, sorry, not DB Express, but the DBX framework would be linked in, as well as FireDAC for the for the database access. So you could you could leave the two of them together and switch, uh, leave your data snap using the DBX framework, or we have examples that show you how to use, uh, use FireDAC uh, to do connections to a data snap server. And FD schema adapter that was all covered in uh, in several code rage sessions and also uh, uh, elsewhere. Um, but that's the database access versus the data snap. I mean, you could have a data snap uh, client and server that are using low, lower level TCP uh, and do a whole bunch of stuff yourself. But but yes, you can replace and not use the DBX framework. Uh, but then there's I'll have to look back. I think Pavel did one. There's FD JSON Reflect, which which allows you to when you have a FireDAC uh, based uh, data snap, allows you to get the JSON and then have changes and send the JSON delta changes back to the data snap server. So uh, you can definitely uh, mix and match, or you can completely switch over to to the non DBX framework uh, data snap. Uh, you can have yeah. DB Express and FireDAC uh, on the in the same uh, system. Just as you can mix uh, DB Go for ADO uh, with FireDAC, with DB Express, I mean all of that, uh, even BD, you can mix and match if you have some specific reason. Uh, in two weeks I'm going to cover BD migration. There's a couple ways to do that if you want to replace your uh, T database, T table, T query from the, the old database engine to FireDAC, then there's a whole Fire, uh, doc wiki section and, and sort of step-by-step -step tutorial. I'll be going through that. The other thing you could, if you've got DBase or Paradox files, uh, you could use the FireDAC ODBC bridge, uh, as long as you have an ODBC driver for that supports Paradox or DBase, which Microsoft uh, provides or I think it was Corel, I don't know who owns it now that owns uh, Paradox. Uh, there's ODBC and you can use the FireDAC to ODBC bridge and and leave it uh, leave the Paradox database the way it is. Uh, otherwise if you want to move to SQL then there's you can migrate there's different tools for migrating uh, Paradox to uh, to choose your favorite uh, a SQL database. There's a, I think it's clevercomponents.com uh, has an a paradox to interbase uh, sample that they give you for free if you want to migrate from paradox to interbase or I guess ultimately to something else. Um, but you can mix and match all these data access commodes. It just means that more runtime libraries are going to be linked in your application. But as Jim mentioned, you can do these kind of migrations one step at a time. They all can work with each other. Uh, underneath the covers, ultimately, it's a T data set uh, somewhere along the way. Yep. Just as you create your own T data set instance and call create fields and populate it if you want to write all the code uh, versus using something like T FD mem table. Let's so I was just looking at the search site. And it doesn't look like they have support listed for Delphi anymore, so you're probably going to want to stick with Rubicon for a full text search. Okay. I know I, they used to have support, so I'm not sure if they took it out or just don't listen on their site anymore. But uh, the Rubicon does definitely works with uh, Delphi. Yeah. If it's a SQL database, then you have something maybe like um, using the SQL L I K E the like 
with the percent signs if you're searching through uh, text data. Um, beyond that, maybe certain databases have some kind of built-in uh, text search. I don't know. I'm not an Oracle, or I don't. There's nothing that I remember for Interbase, but I'm not an Oracle, MySQL. There may be somebody who's got an extension that lets you do something interesting with, uh, uh, you know, live text search on text blobs or or other columns. Uh, yeah, actually, they do. Um, I know Oracle and uh, DBISAM and a few other databases do have full text indexing of. Uh, Call of the text columns in okay. the database, so you can say I want to full text index these. And I've actually written a uh, a system. I believe it was using DBI SAM by Elevate, which I love. DBI SAM by Elevate. It's an awesome component suite. But uh, doing a where you type, and as you typed, it would filter down to the documents that had matches for those, just like you see with Google. Um, did that quite a while ago, so I know it should still be possible today. Uh, Alf is asking, are there any limits on how many components in a data module? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of, other than memory again, I guess. I don't think there's any limit that I remember. I, I've seen issues where people have hundreds of components, maybe thousands of components on a data module, and it gets slow, and they get some like major slowdown issues. Um, there's ways to work around those, but uh, better to have I would say data modules. Yeah, multiple data modules would be the way to go. Because you can have different forms where they only use the unit for, for a specific data module when you do file use unit. Uh, so you could have data modules separated by different databases, different subparts of queries or whatever, and then only use those units uh, in the forms that need them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was at a a tour and this guy had this like, hey, this is really slow. And I was like, let's see. And he had, oh, I don't know, it was a full screen data module and it was solid um, data access components all, and they're overlapping too. It wasn't like they were next to each other, they were overlapping. And it took a couple seconds to open. I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> that's what's going to happen. We actually will figure it out by uh, turning off uh, live bindings. It sped up quite a bit the opening. but. Yeah, so you can put a lot on there, but you know, you should be aware that there are uh, ramifications to doing that. Billy asked, "Does TFD mem table streaming differ differ in data snap rest case? Is it JSON only or is binary possible? As you saw, uh, you can load and save XML, JSON, and binary. Uh, in memory, it has its own in-memory storage system that is uh, not documented, but it has the ability to." to do transformations if you need to do something uh, with the internal structure by using the different methods for FDMEM table. Check all of that out in uh, in the doc wiki. And there's also a bunch of samples, a lot of samples for TFDMEM table uh, in the uh, samples folder uh, for both Object Pascal and C++. Also, uh, if you're doing something with some kind of JSON-related thing, whether it's the REST client libraries or DataSnap or something else, uh, you can use the REST response data set adapter, for example, if you're using REST client libraries, and take the, the JSON response and point it at a TFD mem table, and under the covers, it'll convert it into the internal structure. And then again, you can save it, load it, uh, transform it, delete it, edit it, whatever you want to do. Uh, with FD mem table, uh, once you get it from whatever the application that sent uh, the JSON over to you. So check out the combination um, of FD mem table and REST response data set adapter. Uh, there's also a low level JSON uh, runtime library that you can use methods uh, in there as well. Okay, is this an XE6? Yes, FD mem table's there. Um, Alan asked a question about if he's using clone cursors, he's got three FD mem tables. He loads table one, then he clones table one to tables two and three, uh, refreshes table one. Um, does table two and three detect changes without recloning? I don't know the answer to that. My sense is that you would have to do a refresh of table two and table three. Um, 
but that's just uh, my best guess for now without uh, without testing it. You can go into the doc wiki for clone cursors and FDMM table. Uh, I'll do that in a little bit too once I if we have some time once I get to the through all the questions. Um, but I'll check and and it, it'll make a great uh, little demo and blog post for sure. Uh, Richard likes TFD mem table. He's used it in applications. Likes the speed uh, and performance. Let's see. It's great to use when you want to reduce the overall I/O performance on SQL servers. Exactly, not sending things back and forth. Again, you can you can turn on the cached updates so it doesn't send back every time you change something. It's only when you call apply updates uh, if there's a connection from FD mem table back through wherever the the database was originally. So uh, check out apply updates on FD mem table. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, can T FireDAC JSON reflect in binary instead of JSON? Well, FireDAC JSON reflect sends JSON. So uh, if you want to have some binary, then you need to create your own uh, interface to send uh, an in-memory data set uh, across whatever it is, TCP, HTTP, and so on. Uh, or you can, you can convert the uh, internal version to JSON and then and then pass it along. Uh, is FD mem tables uh, there to replace client data set? In a sense, yes, uh, although client data set is tied to the Midas technology, so you have to carry the Midas runtime with you, uh, runtime library. Uh, client data set has a couple features. You can do aggregations and filters uh, that FD mem table doesn't currently have, uh, but FireDAC is the way forward. FD mem table, FireDAC, all of the components that are in the FireDAC family of components is the way forward. That's where we're spending all of our effort and energy uh, moving forward. T client data set is a data set and it'll stay there, uh, you know, for a long time, but uh, we're doing no real enhanced feature work on T client data set. In fact, Kerry Jensen has finished his client data set second edition. Uh, in depth book, and he said in some of the conversations we've had with him recently that it's done. He's documented everything about client data set that you could ever think about in his book and his blog posts and his code rage sessions. So he's moving over now to write about the uh, about uh, FD mem table in FireDeck. Uh, let's see, Tim was asking. Uh, if you have XC7, just go to the registered user download page, uh, myreg, M-Y-R-E-G, dot um, and or go to Code Central, and then if you're logged in, click on the registered user downloads, or go to EDN2, and under the resources menu, there's registered user downloads link, and you should find Meta Converter, the Object Pascal book, the uh, custom premium styles, and uh, and the Castellia plugin. So go and uh, take a look. And if you can't find them, send me an email to davidi.barkado.com. Uh, using FireDeck even for multi tier applications? Yes, that's why we added the FD JSON Reflect. And Pavel did uh, a skill sprint and a code rage session. And Marco showed also using uh, FireDAC with uh, EMS, which is uh, our second multi tier solution. Uh, the Enterprise Mobility Services, uh, which is separate uh, separate technology from DataSnap. So absolutely, you can use it in multi-tier. Um, let's see. And Ilya's asking, is it possible to ditch JSON and use binary? Uh, again, um, I don't know the answer to that. You can, one of the things I always tell people, and Dimitri says this as well, number one, watch his uh, What's New in FireDAC from Code Rage 8 session. He covers tips and tricks and techniques and new capabilities in XE7 FireDAC. So that's well worth watching. A lot of people ask questions like this. Um, you can also post a message on the FireDAC news group, and Dimitri's all over it. With the time difference to Russia, 11 hours, uh, he responds there, and then if it's a good question and an answer, he puts it in the DocWiki FAQ section uh, and or adds new features. 